So welcome to the Kingdom School, course number three, discovering, no, this is not discovering, <laughs> this is seeing, entering, and manifesting the kingdom, lesson number two. See, I, treat, I teach three courses, six classes a week, plus two Ecclesia meeting, plus one Facebook Live, so nine ministry teaching time, so you can imagine. So in my brain, I am like, which class is this, which class is that? <laughs> who's here, who's where. But God is good. I'm so excited that you're here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your glory. Lord, that we wake up to see your glory, Father, and be transformed from glory to glory, from the image and the likeness of God. I thank you for this class, my God, seeing, entering, manifesting the kingdom. Lord, this is the season to enter into our kingdom assignment. Lord, I thank you for your glory already present upon us. Let your glory fall upon your people. Let them feel from that vibration from their head to toe, Father. Let the touch of God in their soul and their spirit and their body heal them and make us whole, Father. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to bear witness for our King and his kingdom with power, grace, and glory in our life. Lord Jesus, you are the teacher. You are the only teacher on this planet we want to listen. Come and illustrate. Make it so plain and clear to us how this kingdom life practically work in this day, Father. Lord, help me. I don't have anything to say unless you give to me, Father, first. And I completely depended and trusting on you, Father, to do the job today. And we give you all the glory and praise and honor. Kingdom, power, and glory belongs to Jesus Christ, our King and our Lord, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. The moment I started praying, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me that this is the time God's children to transition into their kingdom assignment. Beginning, especially beginning this October of 2020, Holy Spirit already gave me the word for 2021. Usually he waits until December 31st or January 1st to give me a word for that year. But this year he gave it to me in October because then he said, this is the 2021 is going to be the year of transitioning into the kingdom. And I just want to encourage you, all that happened in your life, all that is happening in your life, this is the moment the Father, our Father, is releasing His people, His children, into their kingdom assignment. And we have been all brought up in this world system of survival. We went to school to get a job, to find a, or start a business, to make some money, to make, some, make a living. But when you come to God's kingdom, God sent you and I with a specific assignment on this, to this planet Earth to accomplish it for him, his kingdom assignment. And that kingdom assignment include your provision. Just like Adam was created for what? Not to survive on the earth, not to find a job, not to go to school, Adam was created for a specific assignment. He was born into his kingdom assignment because he was not born into sin like we did. We did. We do. He was created and launched into his kingdom assignment. And his father, our father, knew whatever Adam needed. So God planted the garden, prepared his food, prepared everything he needed. And he released him and told him what needs to. That is the original blueprint for human life on earth. So each of our life after Adam should have, would have been born doing the same thing. Not the same thing means following the same pattern, following the same blueprint. You have, I have a kingdom assignment. 
and the Father has prepared. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 8 and 32. The Father knows what you need before you ask him. God the Father knew Adam what Adam would need to fulfill that assignment. So Jesus took this 12 disciples, trained them. He fired them from their business. <laughs> you know what I mean? They were business people. But that was not their kingdom assignment. They were doing that for survival. They had to live their business to be launched into their kingdom assignment. Then Jesus trained them. I was sharing this on Facebook Live yesterday, but I'm feeling encouraged to share with you because some of you may not have watched that Facebook Live. Then he sent them out and he told them, don't take any money with you. Don't take any extra pieces of clothes. Don't take any staff or a suitcase with you. Why? Because this is the time you are going to experience that this kingdom life will work. You have to depend on your kingdom assignment for your provision or your provision is in your kingdom assignment. And when they came back, Jesus asked, hey, guys, did you lack anything when you went? And they said, no. <laughs> that is kingdom living. And so that does not mean we're all called to be apostles like they did. No. That is a principle in the kingdom. Whatever your kingdom assignment is, that's where God wants to bring the provision through. So your kingdom assignment, your calling in God's kingdom is the system through which God provides for his people. That's how, that's the channel, your kingdom assignment or your calling, what he called you to do is the system through which he brings in the provision that you need in your life. So that is the word of the Lord for somebody out there this morning. That's why I'm so passionate about teaching people about their kingdom assignment. I don't teach about starting businesses. I don't teach about something else. But if that is your calling in God's kingdom to go and start a business, go for it. If if God called you to go into politics, go for it. If God called you to invent something, go for it. Each of us are called to do something different in God's kingdom. So what he did with the disciples was a principle or a blueprint. What he did to Adam was our blueprint or our pattern that we need to follow. So we are not born into his kingdom like Adam did. We were born into this world system that has been held captive by the devil and his kingdom. So we grew up learning to survive. And at some point in our life, we got born again. Just like Adam was born into the kingdom, we got born again into his kingdom. That's why God allows us to be born again. For what? To see his kingdom. That's what the Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 3. Unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom. When Adam opened his eyes, he saw God's kingdom, the Garden of Eden. When you got born again, you're supposed to see God's kingdom. To see that assignment your father has prepared for you. From that moment onwards, you're supposed to follow that blueprint with all your heart, kidneys, hands, and strength, everything you got. <laughs> but it scares people to step out. This has been so natural for me now because I started this when I was 16. I saw something when I was 16 years old. My father wanted me to go to the medical field. My mother told me to join the army. <laughs> you know, but in a prayer meeting that I spent with my brother and a friend of mine from 8.30 at night to 4.30 in the morning, Something happened in my spirit, man. I saw something God had prepared for me. No eye has seen, no ear hath heard, neither entered into the hearts of men what God had prepared for them. And I left my home following that blueprint when I was 18 years old. And ever since, that kingdom assignment is the source through which God has been providing 
That's where the provision comes from, through that assignment. So each of you has a kingdom assignment from our father, from your father in his kingdom. Life is too precious to be spent on survival, trying to make some money. That's not life was made for. So today's question is, the first question is, why have we received Jesus but rejected his message? Most people received Jesus because they were scared to go to hell. That's the message they heard. Do you want to go to heaven or you want to go to hell? Who wants to go to hell? <laughs> so they will receive Jesus. Oh, I want Jesus. I want to go to heaven. And that is the number one reason most people received Jesus, but they had no clue what Jesus preached. And I write in my books that God gave me that Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, never asked an individual on this planet earth if they want to go to heaven when they die. And that shocked me. If Jesus came to take everybody to heaven, why didn't he ask anybody, not even a single human, that he asked, do you want to go to heaven when you die? <laughs> Lord, have mercy on us. Apostles didn't ask that question. What was the message Jesus preached? Is it, is it going to heaven wrong? No, we all should go to heaven. There's nothing wrong with it. If you die today, I believe if you believe in Jesus, you will go to heaven. But life is much more than just making it to heaven when you die. There's a life to be lived, fulfilling that kingdom assignment. So we received Jesus because we were scared by people, by preachers about hell. And we said, oh, we want Jesus. But they did not tell us the message that he preached from the first day of his ministry on this earth till the last day on this planet earth. Jesus had one message. Jesus healed the sick, but healing was not his message. That healing was a message about the kingdom that was about to manifest on the earth. Everything Jesus did was an announcement. That's what he told the disciples to to do, go and heal the sick, cast out demons. And after you tell them, the kingdom of heaven is near. Today we do some miracles, we broadcast on television, but we never tell the true message of the kingdom after that. We just take an offering and then go home. The preacher get wealthy, the people go back and do the same thing what they always did. <laughs> Jesus healed the sick, but healing was not his message. Jesus is full of grace and truth, but grace was not his message. There are so many people who go after grace these days, the message of grace. He was full of his grace, full of grace, but grace was not his message. He only mentioned being born again once to a Jewish rabbi in the middle of the night in a private meeting. Never preached it in public. That's another shocking thing that I had to ask him. <laughs> Lord, why didn't you preach about born again in public? Jesus cast out demons, but deliverance was not his message. There's no deliverance ministry. There's no healing ministry. There's no such ministry in the Bible. We have built Bible schools, seminaries, cemeteries. No, seminaries. And training centers on those things Jesus did, but avoided his message. Like I say to people, I spent five years in cemeteries, no, seminaries, but there was not a single message on the kingdom in those five years. Then I went to another training schools like YWAM and other places, not even a single subject on the kingdom, the most important subject Jesus preached and taught. That devil is a liar to hide the message of the kingdom when it is plainly written from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, and most people miss it. 
what was the message Jesus preached? What was the message that the Father sent him to communicate? It is the kingdom of God. God created, this is the third course, though you know by now the foundation, God created this earth, this planet, for one reason, to establish his kingdom and his will here as it is in heaven. And he's so committed to that plan, whether man cooperates with him, church cooperates with him, God will not change his purpose or his plan. It too will come to pass. That's what we see in Revelation eleven fifteen. So what keeps people? Why did the, we lost, lose the, the message of the kingdom all these years? People ask me, Abraham, where do you get this message from now? <laughs> Why nobody else is preaching? Why my grandpa didn't preach? Where do you get this thing from? Because they can't believe what they're hearing. And when they're hearing, they know it is the truth. And when they open the Bible, it's right there. <laughs> it jumps out to their eyes. Oh my goodness, how come I didn't see this before? The number one thing that keeps people from kingdom of God is fear. What is fear? I'm going to explain a little bit. Because even today, when people hear the message of the kingdom, they are, skept they are skeptical. Is this true? What I'm hearing? Because that's not what I heard growing up in my church, like, I, like you did. I did not hear the message of the kingdom, even though I grew up in church, not even a single message on the kingdom. I heard a lot about heaven, going to heaven, rapture, revival, but not a single message that Jesus preached. So fear is an evil spirit. Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. The very reason God created us, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. If we don't spend our life on building God's kingdom on earth, our life goes wasted. Because that is the only reason he sent us, he created us humans and put his spirit in us, put his DNA in us. We carry the same DNA of God, the image and likeness of God. God is a king, he has a kingdom and he created us and he told us, go and rule this planet for me as my children and establish my kingdom and my will. And the enemy, you know what happened through deception stole that right from us and he established a kingdom and we were all born into that kingdom of survival and we will learn about that more the second thing that keep people out of god's kingdom is just good old pride because we have to bow our head to enter the kingdom we won't go in like this keeping our nose height in the air into the kingdom there has to be a little bit of humility when it comes to God's kingdom because we have to surrender our will to do the will of our Father who sent us. And most people, they don't like surrendering. They don't like yielding. They are their own God. They are their own boss. They want to do what they want to do when they want to do it. And that keeps them out of God's kingdom and their kingdom assignment. And then they reach their prime age. They come, oh my goodness, why am I here? What am I doing with my life? I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm depressed. I have all these issues now. Because we neglected the very essence of life and the purpose and the reason God sent us to this planet Earth for. And the third reason that keeps people out of God's kingdom is self-reliance. We were brought up as brought up in an individualistic society, in a culture. Me, myself, and I is the mantra of the day. And there are people I meet all the time. Abraham, I'm going to make this happen. They tell me when they hear the gospel of the kingdom, I'm going to do this and make this happen. And after three days, I don't see them. Because this is not, 
we make it happen in our own strength. It's not by might, it's not by power. It can be only possible through his Holy Spirit. Complete, dead reliance on the Holy Spirit. Complete. Without the Holy Spirit, our reliance and dependency on him, no kingdom life. And the fourth reason that keeps people out of God's kingdom is self-righteousness. People likes to brag about themselves, what they did, what they achieved, what degree they have, and what kind of job they do. My Lord, my God, I, I pray for people sometimes. Lord, when they people come and tell me, that's what I told yesterday, please don't glory in ourselves or in a preacher or anybody. The Bible says, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord for what he has done. You know the story of the, the parable of the two sons that Jesus shared, right? We call it the prodigal son parable. Jesus did not call it a prodigal son. He shared the parable of two sons. Those two sons are equally important in that story, not just the prodigal son who left the home. The older son was another kind of a son who was working in the field like a slave, even though he was living in his, in his own father's house, never enjoyed a blessing that his father had. And you learned that in the previous courses. Some of you were not there in the previous courses. Those two sons, even though they're sons, they did not enjoy the blessings of their father because of self-righteousness. They want to achieve it by working hard. So this is the time of great exodus. What do I mean by that? Everything, this pandemic or plantemic that people call it. I agree with it. This is, this is not just planned by people. This is planned or allowed by God, giving the worldwide body of Christ to transition into God's kingdom, to exodus. You know, in the Egypt, God sent the plagues. That was the time of deliverance for God's people. This is a plague that happening globally. This is the time of deliverance for God's people from the bondage of the religious spirit and from the bondage of the Babylonian system. There are two things that enslaves God's people, not God's people, humans. And we are going to learn that. Why are we here? God told Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me. That is the order. That is the, that is the commandment the Lord told Pharaoh. That means God's people were in Egypt. They were not serving God. They were not free to serve God and his purposes. Whom they were serving, they were serving Pharaoh and his kingdom, building bridges, palaces, gardens, and storehouses and pyramids, whatever the Pharaoh, their king wanted, the master, their master wanted, they slaved their life, their skill, their potential, their strength, their life was spent on building Egypt and its gods they were serving. But God's people, God created for what? Not to serve Egypt and Pharaoh and his gods and his system slaving away they're giving away their potential and their skill and their creativity god created his people to serve his kingdom and i'm going to issue and declare an announcement today to the demonic world let my people go says the lord to serve him and his kingdom assignment because majority of the people on this planet Earth are being held captive by a demonic system for survival. They are not free to do what God called them, and most don't know what God called them. 
the greatest commandment is to love you shall love the lord your god with all your heart not 10 percent not just on a sunday morning for two hours all your soul with all your mind every ounce of creativity that god puts in you should be used for god's kingdom everything in your soul must seek god and love him and with all our strength as much as strength that god has given me that is my cry to god lord use me while i have the strength so i may run for your kingdom to the ends of the earth if you want me to go to the amazon jungle i will go there and that picture that you see there, Chinese, the Great Wall in China, I was there. <laughs> I climbed the Great Wall in China. That was an amazing experience. And this is the first and foremost commandment from God. Love God. Love God means it's not just by saying with our mouth. How do we love him? With all our heart has to be involved. That means there is nothing else more important than him and his assignment and his kingdom with all our soul our soul needs to be preoccupied our mind needs to be completely occupied with the god's kingdom and his mission on the earth because that is the only reason we are alive but how many people are free today to love and serve god with all their strength all their heart all their mind just examine that on this planet earth out of 7.5 billion people just examine about christians wonderful believers how many of them are really truly free why because they have been held captive by a system that steals their strength their stamina their creativity to build a different kingdom and it is time for God's people's exodus. This is the season of exodus for God's people. And God is giving us a golden opportunity through this pandemic for that transition to take place. And I believe until God's people make that transition, God will not lift this plague from this planet. And it will keep going or something else will come until god's people wakes up to their eternal destiny and stand up in their places for their god and taking the sword of the spirit and running to battle not waiting to escape this planet but ready to give their blood if it needs to be people are ready to die for their country and their kings and their kingdoms in the olden days thousands will lay their life for an earthly king and their kingdom what if we have such people in god's kingdom who is not afraid of their life who is willing to give everything they have because that's the only reason we are here how will we do that if we are tied up with a job to survive six days a week how do we serve God with all our heart, with all our soul, mind and strength when we are tied up in a different system for survival? Employment is not the problem. Places like India, they think employment is the problem. Employment is not the problem. People doesn't know their kingdom assignment, why God put them on the earth. what is slavery i'm so sorry this is so provocative i was going to apologize to you in the beginning what i'm going to share today is very provocative and it's not this course is not about making you feel good sermon then i ask for an offering no i don't do that <laughs> this, this is surgery this is kingdom surgery so I apologize because why God gave me this assignment, I asked him, Lord, why did you give me this task? Give to my brother Navaratan Singh from India. <laughs> what is slavery? Slavery is when you're not free to do what you were born to do. 
You could be living in the most free society in the world and you're not free to do what you are born to do. But you could live in the most oppressive kingdom or government on this planet Earth, but you could be free inside to do what you're born to do like Daniel, Esther, many people that we read in the Bible, they were not living in the free society like we do. They were living in the most oppressive, threatened for lie, but they fulfilled their assignment in their kingdom assignment. So, so freedom is not living in a free society, doing what we want to do, when we want to do, whatever we want to do. That's not freedom. Freedom is, true freedom is, when you're free to do what you're born to do, that is true freedom. You're doing something against your will and conscience. You know in your spirit man, you're supposed to be doing something different. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit is drawing you, calling you, son, daughter, this is what you should be doing. But we are stuck in something. What is the solution? You're forced to do something against what your heart is saying. Slaves are not permitted to own anything. You know, when I came to, to be honest with you, in India, there's so many slum areas, people living in shacks, in Mumbai, Delhi, if you go to some cities, millions of people live in slums. And when I came to the United States, I found something very interesting. People here can own or buy something, but they don't own it. Some bank or somebody else own it. They borrow the money and they live their life to pay off that loan for 30 years, 40 years. And I said, Lord, which one is better? <laughs> the people who own the shack, that belongs to them. Nobody can question that. Nobody can take that away from them. But here we are in a different glorified form of, Lord have mercy. I don't want to say it. Slaves are not free to fulfill their destiny. People of God in Egypt, remember? They were not free to fulfill their destiny. That's why God wants to bring them out of Egypt. Slaves are not free to serve God or fulfill their calling. Slaves are not free to build God's kingdom. They are preoccupied with something else. Slaves are not free to maximize their potential. Nobody exhausts their full potential God deposited in them. But we were programmed, trained to do a job. We went to school. Lord have mercy. Slavery is in one sentence is the condition when a person is not able to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and not able to do what they were sent to this planet earth for by our God. So two systems that enslaves people from Genesis to Revelation. I saw something very interesting. There are two countries that are named. Actually, they don't just represent two countries. They represent two systems that is mentioned from Revelation. No, from Genesis to Revelation. Those are Egypt and Babylon. These two names mentioned from the first book to the last book of the Bible. Why? Because they represent not just a political nation that existed thousands of years ago. They represent a demonic system. These two nations mentioned from Genesis to Revelation are very significant to understand. They are not just two historic nations, but demonic systems that the devil uses to enslave God's people in every generation. So they won't discover God's kingdom to fulfill their purpose. That is the purpose of these two systems, to blind humans from God's kingdom and his assignment. And how do they function? Egypt represents a religious system. 
that is the country where origin of all these various religions that we saw today originated in Egypt. All the magic, all the witchcraft, all kinds of sorceries, everything that came, it came out of Egypt. It's the religious system. And that's the same spirit that works behind every religious system that started in Egypt. And Babylon, on the other side, it's a different kind of system. It is a political and economic system. It includes fun, human achievements, and political parties, and all kinds of glitters and hanging gardens that we read about Babylon. And very interestingly, these two countries, we all start in Egypt, spiritually, under various religious bondages. But when did God's children, oh, actually Babylon also started in, in, in Genesis. So if the devil cannot deceive people through religion, what he will offer them, he will offer them lots of fun sexes and money and fame that is the babylonian system so people who are oppressed in religion they say oh my goodness look at that babylonian system it looks so attractive very successful lots of money and fame but they don't know who is controlling these two systems from above the demonic force that uses these two systems to blind God's people or just humans, not just God's people, anybody. And when God told me this, the religious spirit, you know, the Pharisees in the first century when Jesus came, they thought they were serving God. I was a Pharisee. I was a religious Pharisee for 30 years of my life. I thought I was serving God. I was not serving God. I was trying to establish Abraham John's kingdom. And I didn't know it because I was blinded by this religious spirit. And that's what happened to the Jewish leaders in the first century. They thought they were serving God when they were fighting against God and his very purpose. How can that be? How can that be that people will feel, feel that they're serving God, but with their very being, they fight against God and his purpose? That is the power of the deception of the religious spirit. And I was under it. And God had to set me free because I wanted to be free. One represents, the Egypt represents the religious spirit. The Babylonian system represents the spirit of this world that we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. We have not received the spirit of this world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we may know the things that have been freely given to us by our, earthly, by our heavenly father. That's what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. Actually, 9 to 11. Please write those scriptures down so you can read it later. Deception of the world system. Everything in this world is geared toward hindering or blinding us from discovering God's kingdom and fulfilling our kingdom destiny. Our culture, education, religion, and government conditions us, condition us, to believe that we need to seek to be successful first of all. We are taught that this can be achieved by getting a good education, finding a good job, and then makes a lot of money and a life partner. Then we have been conditioned to function that way naturally. Our natural instinct is to make choices based on trying to survive or make a living. And then at the end of life, if there is any life left, we will serve God. That is the deception of the world system. From the very beginning, we should have been serving our king and his assignment on the earth. 
This is a worldwide pandemic. Most people are trapped in the snare of the enemy and working to provide for themselves and their families. In truth, they are working against God, the word of God, and against the kingdom of God. What is the solution for this? How do we stop it before another generation goes into eternity without fulfilling their destiny? If what you are doing is called by God, there's nothing wrong with it. Whatever job you're doing, whatever business you're doing, if that is your kingdom assignment, we need to celebrate. There's nothing wrong with it. Absolutely fine. But in your heart, in your spirit, man, God has put a blueprint of your destiny, but you're stuck on something that you are not enjoying. That's what I'm talking about. Life after salvation, life after born again. Lord means honor. Once we accept Jesus as our Lord, but again, we got the wrong message. We got Jesus. We thought we are going to go to heaven. We escaped hell. We're going to heaven. Let's sit around and wait until the rapture happens. Or it's all about become about me. It's my life. Once we accept Jesus, me is dead. <laughs> That's what you, Paul said. I am crucified. I was dead when Christ dead on, died on the cross. Once we accept Jesus as our Lord, from that minute on, we belong to him for all eternity, not just a couple of hours on a Sunday morning. From the moment we are saved, we are supposed to be serving him with our lives and everything we have. When we are saved, we are supposed to pick up our original assignment and continue the task God sent us here to do, where Adam left off. Remember why salvation came? Salvation came because of the fall of Adam. And what goal God was trying to achieve through salvation is to restore mankind and put them back where they fell from. And that's what salvation is supposed to do for us but we have not been taught correctly about what happened to us when we were saved. What is the benefit of going to heaven when our life on earth was spent building the kingdom of darkness, when majority of our time and our money and strength went to a different kingdom to benefit a different kingdom, or the kingdom of darkness benefited from us? Who gets the best out of us? or who got the best out of us. Who is benefiting the most from our life? God or the devil? God's kingdom or the kingdom of darkness? The time you spend here on earth is the most important segment of your life. The next life will be the reward for what you did while you were here. If you didn't do much for God's kingdom in this life, then there won't be a great reward in the next we should be able to say like paul said or jesus said i finished my race father i finished the work that you gave me to do whatever that might be so how how did the israelites serve god after they were freed from egypt god said let my people go for what to serve him they didn't go around conducting music concerts with smoke machines and colored lights. They possessed the land and established a nation, a kingdom for God. In the wilderness, they were being prepared to function as God's nation or an ecclesia. When Stephen preached his only one message before he was killed in Acts chapter 7, Actually, it's seven, chapter 7, verse 58, that verse. Actually, let me just double check in my Bible. When Stephen said the ecclesia in the wilderness or the church in the wilderness, that's what he was saying. Oh, it is 38. Sorry, it is right. So Stephen was preaching the history of people of Israel. He said the church in the wilderness in Acts 7, 38 or the ecclesia. In King James, it uses the church in the wilderness. How did the Old Testament 
people functioned as a church. The Ecclesia did not start on the day of Pentecost. Ecclesia has been a concept that started in the Garden of Eden. Adam was the first member of God's Ecclesia on this planet Earth. So in the wilderness, they were being prepared to, to function as a nation. We are a holy nation. They were a holy nation. The church supposed to be functioning as a nation in God's kingdom, manifesting God's kingdom on the earth. How many of us are free to serve him with our time, our energy, skills, gifts, and breath? In other words, how many of us are free to obey the first and greatest commandment, which is to love God with all our heart, soul, and strength? But how can we love him with all our strength when the majority of that strength is being used to build another kingdom or our own kingdom? We need to serve God and his kingdom with our spirit, soul, and body. Every ounce of our energy, health, skills, and talents must be used to serve him. How do we walk in that in a practical manner? Who will pay us to serve him? When we think about serving God, we think about going to church and assuring or praying or doing something there within the four walls of the church, right? And people... No, serving God means with our own life, our own very life, our own very breath that he gave us completely, totally, 100%. Now, the question is, how do we get paid? That's the, that's the first question. People ask me also, Abraham, we are going to come and help you, but how much are you going to pay me? This course is designed for those who are interested in finding and fulfilling their calling on the earth. When we do that, everything we need in life will come to us as a reward. That is why Jesus said to seek his kingdom and his righteousness first, then all the things we need will be added to us. Just like it was added to Adam in the beginning, Jesus is saying the same thing to us today. It will be those things that we have been working our life for will be added to us. We won't be working for those, but it will be added to us. Adam didn't work for the garden. The garden was given to him. It is important to note that nobody in the Bible who God used did anything to make a living. And I'm going to come to Paul and say why he did the tent making business. They were living out their calling. And as a result, food and water and clothing were added to them. They were busy fulfilling their calling and the things they needed were supplied. It was only before they discovered their calling that they did something else for a living until they were born again or until they were saved. Jesus was a carpenter. Moses was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. But Paul, we see something different. Paul says he was a tent maker. So people use that, say, oh, Paul did this business, so I am also going to do business. The reason Paul did tent making business, he explains that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses, not because the churches that he planted was unable to support him. He took a vow on his own, that I'm not going to receive any support from the churches that I planted. I am going to work with my own hands so that nobody will get a chance to blame me with anything. So he explains that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14, he himself wrote, those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. This is Paul writing. Did he live against what he wrote? No. The Lord commands those who work in the temple should be in the altar, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 9, 13 and 14. And those who serve the altar partake of the offerings of the altar. Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. And then he says why? 
he did the tent making, but I have used none of those rights that I had, nor I have written these things that it should be done so to me, for it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. <laughs> That is the reason Paul did this tent making business because he was so zealous. I would say a little over zealous. God wants this earth to be an extension of heaven. He wants to colonize earth with heaven. He wants the same quality of life, culture, economy, and everything else that is in heaven to be manifested on the earth. He never imagined life on earth to be any different than life in heaven. And here we see our life, even though we have more Christians in this great country, United States, more churches per capita, we are at the brink of something. Because the church left its first love and the first mandate that God gave to us. God wanted to rule the earth, but he had a problem. He is spirit. Earth is a physical planet, and anyone living here must have a physical body. God doesn't have a physical body like ours. He could not live on this earth because of that. If he wanted to live and accomplish anything here, either he needed to create a body, or he needed someone else who had a body who would allow him to use it. That's why he gave us this body. So God get a legal right to operate function on the earth, accomplishing. That's why we are called the body of Christ. We make Christ legal on the earth to operate. We are supposed to provide a body for Christ to do whatever he wants to do, to rule, to reign, to heal, to touch. We're supposed to make Christ legal in the media world. We're supposed to make Christ legal in the political world. We're supposed to make Christ legal in the economic world, in the educational world. We were the one, the body of Christ, supposed to be there. If we are not there, the enemy will take over. Any place that left vacant on the earth, any area, any systems, that is left vacant, the enemy will occupy it and establish his kingdom. The purpose of our body is to give God the legal right to operate in the physical world to accomplish his will on the earth. Because only people with the body has the legal right. Any creatures with a physical body has the legal right to do anything on the earth the moment we lose our body, we become illegal on the earth. Then we have to wait until we receive our glorified body to come back to earth to continue the task that he gave to Adam in Genesis 1.26. So God called the species Adam or mankind. Adam's responsibility was to fulfill the assignment of his father who is in heaven because Adam has the same spirit and DNA that God has He's called the son of God. Adam's spirit and DNA came from God. Adam was to the earth what God was in heaven. Adam's responsibility was to represent his father and carry out the task he gave him, which is to rule the earth. God created us for his purpose and put us on the earth to do his will. His will is to see his kingdom established on the earth, not to see all of us in heaven but to see his kingdom established on the earth so that his will is done here as it is in heaven. God also knew that this man needed certain things to fulfill his purpose and live on the earth. He needed food, water, a place to stay, and clothing. He decided to provide those. God never intended for man to work for his food, clothing, and shelter. It was a provision or a benefit added to him by God for doing his will on the earth so god came down and planted a garden and took the man he created and put him in it the garden came with his food clothing and habitation adam did not work in the garden for those they were given to him by god 
They were ready before he arrived in the garden as part of the package. They came with the kingdom assignment God had for him. He did not have to worry about any of those needs. As long as he fulfilled the task God had for him, it was not the plan of God for man to ever worry about provision. Man's task was to fully engage with the assignment God gave him. Why did God provide everything Adam needed? So that he could be free to fulfill his purpose. His entire life was supposed to be spent doing God's assignment. God didn't want him to work for his food. Food and everything else was part of the package, his kingdom assignment, as is ours. God wanted Adam to be free to fully focus on the task he gave him. As long as man fulfilled the assignment God had for him and lived in his kingdom, he never lacked anything. This was God's original intention and plan for mankind. Each person born after Adam would experience the same kind of life. They would continue the assignment God had for them. And in turn, he would continue to supply their needs so they would focus and fulfill their kingdom assignment. And we are going to finish that here today. Father, I thank you for this revelation. Lord, this is so heavy. This was so heavy, Father. Give us the grace to understand, to assimilate, to and where do we go from here, Father? We are here in this moment, particular moment in life, in time. And thank you for giving us grace and wisdom and guidance on what we should do with what we heard and what we know, Father. Holy Spirit, thank you for making it real, making it clear. I bless my brothers and sisters from around the globe who joined I bless them, Father. I thank you for your kingdom assignment for their life, their, your plans for them. I thank you for releasing them to their kingdom assignment in this season. I thank you for the preparation. I give you all the glory and praise and honor. In Jesus Christ's holy name, Lord, we submit this word into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Whew, my Lord, my God, that's like a five-course meal. <laughs> we want some dessert now. <laughs> we want some ice cream. <laughs> oh, Manchi, you have some dessert. <laughs> we need some dessert after that. Oh, my goodness, that was steak. That was full of steak, so any... <laughs> I don't even want to ask for any comments or feedback or question today. <laughs> because I was like, Lord, I don't want to share this. I don't want to say this. But I'm sorry, not sorry, but I have to. That's my assignment. That's my task. Imagine that. Um, so, <laughs> so any comments or feedback or questions regarding what you heard or from what you heard, this is the time. So just unmute your microphone and please go ahead. Abraham, uh, I, Michelle, go oh, go ahead, whoever you nope. are. No, nope, go ahead. I just want to say, Abraham, please don't apologize because learning and wisdom go hand in hand and we appreciate what you're teaching us and it's truth. And we know that when we're chastised, we know God loves us and that's why he... He prunes us, and so we just thank you. Don't ever apologize for what you're teaching. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for receiving it. Darcy, your turn. Um, I know you have a lot of experience in this, Darcy. You know, God has been preparing you, training you. My goodness, I wish we had time to share all those, but please yeah. go ahead. You know, I think that... Um, I got divorced 14 years ago and I'd been in ministry big for 10 years. And so life changed, but God's purpose for me never changed. Mm. And I think today um, it just gave me confidence to quiet more 
and listen deeper and to ask more boldly because nothing in the natural really flies. I always have provision, but he's got, I'm supposed to write like five books and how do you do that, <laughs> you know? And you're trying to be a tent maker and you're 59 and you're single. And this just empowered me to, um, to ask deeper and especially with the heavenly father. So I'm just so grateful. I'm grateful I met Jerry and that I'm here today on this. I'm grateful that I'm in Michigan and not home busying myself, that I'm in a hotel room, that I could meet these fabulous people. And I have to tell you, Abraham, it's what I've lived in for 41 years. And I encourage the people that are listening to this. This is the message. And we have complicated things. And God is just stripping it away to give us peace. And this is where peace comes from. This is where answers come from. So thank you. I got a lot to process. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Darcy. I know. You know, when I... When he called me the other day last week, that's the same word God gave me. This is the season to transition into your kingdom assignment. All these years, God has been preparing you. And you are going to write those books, not just five, more than that. I know. I never <laughs> thought I could write even a single book. Look at what this shelf full of books behind me. <laughs> yeah. 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 God can do it. It is his grace that will do yeah. it through us. And we're just yielded to him, to the Father, like you were saying. My goodness, when we yield, he does more than what we could do in our own strength in 30, 40 years. Yeah, it's powerful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank God for you. I can't wait to see what God is going to do in you and through you. This is an exciting season. It is. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Faith, welcome. You come in late. I saw you coming in. Thank you for joining. How are you? I'm okay. I'm so sorry. My alarm didn't go off. And, and so I came in late, but I'm glad to be here. Okay, glad you're here. Good to see you. Anybody else have any comments or feedback or questions? Yes, Pastor Moses. Yes, I think, uh, Pastor Abraham, you have just given a very good description and explanation on the verse on uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 32-33, that is, uh, ask for the kingdom and the righteousness, and everything will be added unto you. So somehow it is difficult to understand how it works. Yeah, but uh, I think you have given us a uh, very good explanation and description how about how this works. So thank you. It's very important. So uh, I do have some questions, but not on this class, but on the class last week. I'm not quite sure whether you have time to discuss about that. You mean the last lesson? The last lesson yes. we had? Yeah, for, for last Wednesday, yes. Last Wednesday, today's the, the first class. I mean, the first session. First session. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. If it is, if it takes me okay. longer than an hour, then we have to talk personally. So you should be quite I, simple for you. Yeah. Yeah. Go so ahead. So I, I, I read your book. So I, I, I read your book, and uh, and actually, last time you also mentioned that um, the same fundamental questions that somehow I need to have a very clear understanding about it. That is about the, the, the saving grace and also born again, these two events. <laughs> and what I get from your book is, you believe that being born again is the first step to salvation. Yeah. So that means if a person is born again, he, he should be in the, enter into the process of being saved. Yeah. Am I right? <laughs> I thought he. I thought it was the other way around. No, <laughs> that, that's something I want to chat with you because I think uh, I also check into your other reference books. It, it says the same thing. That is, born again, go first, and then the salvation comes. So you are 
that is exactly the same as what you said in, in your book. Born again is the first step. And then you get into the process of salvation. Yeah. You yeah. Know. So, yeah, that's why we have no problem with that. The problem is, will there be people who actually, they see the kingdom of God and they were born again, but they are not saved? Yeah, thank you, Pastor Ma. I will I will simplify it the the way I it I can. So Pastor Moses Chan, he is joining us from Hong Kong. He's in ministry there, ministering to the people, Chinese people, anybody he can. And somehow he found us online. He ordered all this Kingdom Discipling Nation series book, twelve volumes. So I mailed it to him in a box to Hong Kong. Thank <laughs> God he got it. So this was my dilemma, Pastor Moses. I met so many people who thought they were saved, but they had no clue on why they were on this planet, about their purpose or their calling. I know even today here in Denver, 75 years young, people come and ask me and tell me, Abraham, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with my life. And they are retired, they work their jobs and but they're still feeling like there's something inside of them that they should have done, but they didn't do it. And now they don't know where to go and to make sure what it is. So it became a puzzle for me, Lord, how come this many saved spirit filled church members who went to church for 40 years, 50 years, still have no clue about what God sent them to this planet earth for. And that's when this born again experience came to my my attention by the Holy Spirit. And see, I thought I was taught by the church saying, if you're to born again, you go to heaven or you get, you get born again to go to heaven. But Jesus never said that. He said in Matthew chapter, no, John chapter three, verse three, he said, unless you're born again to see the kingdom. Oh my goodness. That, that opened up a whole new realm for me. Understanding for me. So, so when a person is born again. The purpose of being born again is to see his kingdom. Salvation at the same time in, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, we see if you receive Jesus into your heart, you confess with, you, with your mouth that he was died, crucified, raised from the dead. And Paul says, then you shall be saved. That salvation is talking about the eternal salvation from the eternal damnation of hell. That because of sin that Adam brought upon humanity through Jesus, you get saved from that. But the born again experience is for a whole different purpose to show you the kingdom. So anytime somebody is born, even in the natural, there has to be a birthing process. There has to be a seed involved. So Peter is the one who gives us the key about how this born again really happens. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, Peter says, we are born again by the seed of God's word. In some point in life, the word of God, the seed, the sperma, that's the word is used in Greek, sperma means sperm, that God's word, every word of God is a seed that comes and enters the spirit of a man when it's being preached or read through dreams, through audible voice, through conversation, prophecy. I don't know how that happens. Nobody can regulate when a person is born again. It's a supernatural light. Jesus said the spirit blows like a wind. You don't know where it is coming from, where it is going. Those are like the, those who are born of the spirit. So when that word enters into the spirit mind, like a sperm enters an egg, Something happened to the spirit of a human being. That spirit man comes alive. And all of a sudden, he's, he or she sees something about their future that God has prepared for them. Because that seed of God's word is the blueprint of your destiny. And that's what happened throughout the Bible for God's people. The word of the Lord came to them. Like uh, Peter, James, and John, Jesus said, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. That was the word. That was the hook, the bait that Jesus threw. And they followed that word. 
and something happened to them and they left their boat, their net and their business, their fathers and they followed him. Unless that word comes to you, it is through the word. When, the, when people came to John the Baptist and asked him, who are you? He said, are you the Christ? Are you Elijah? Are you one of the prophets? He said, no, I am the voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way. He quoted his blueprint, the word for which God sent him to this planet Earth. That was John's assignment in the kingdom. From Isaiah, he quoted that verse. So hope that makes sense. Hope this makes sense. Well, it does. And uh, uh, what I'm thinking is about your message is, is excellent. And one thing is, if I were to preach this message to non-believers, they would like, they would love it. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, they would love it because what I <laughs> believers will have a hiccup because they have been misinformed for so long. <laughs> well, because there are so many people, they they get the vision, and uh, they kind of they understand their destiny, but they do, do not believe in Christ. In our definitions, it sounds, it sounds like that when you're born again, you're supposed to see something new. God's kingdom. But this is the, this is the kingdom. But obviously, many my fellow Christians, they, they may be there, they are saved already, but obviously, they are not born again <laughs> from our definition. Obviously, they are not born again. And they, they, are, they are the majority, actually. They yeah. are the majority. So that's why I keep on asking this question because this is very fundamental. Yeah. If I do not make this clear, I cannot teach. Yeah. <laughs> and also one point that is maybe, maybe they are born again. Maybe at the time they, they receive their salvation, they are born again. Mm. Or, or more correctly, I can say that they were born again. And then after one or two seconds, they are saved. <laughs> this is according to some of the systematic theology textbooks. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting. That is, for those people, I think they are safe and also born again. Will that be a possibility that, yes, they are born. They are born again. But the point is, they were never raised up. Yeah. So they're killed outside the kingdom of God. Yeah. Or they get into the kingdom of God, but they just near to the door, but never get into the kingdom. Yeah. Will that be a the possibility of there are so many my fellow Christians? Obviously, they do not have the experience of seeing the kingdom, mm. but they claim themselves born again and being saved. I would like to have your opinion on that. <laughs> <laughs> the simple question: Did you see the kingdom when you were born again? Do you know what <laughs> you were born to do? <laughs> you know, yeah, a lot of people. They will say that, well, I know my destiny, but that has nothing to do with Christianity. So that's why I say, if I were to preach this message to non-believers, they will be happy. Yeah. And for when we preach to believers, see, there is a, there's a step that we had to take them before we give them the whole thing. You know, I don't tell everybody everything I know. That's what I tell people. Even this is, this is the third course that you're part of now. There was other two courses to prepare people to reach here. And I didn't plan this way. God mm -hmm. orchestrated it. So people who took those two courses, when they hear this, all of a sudden this is just added to what they already heard before. It's just going from one step to the next, like a first grade, second grade, third, and it just keep going. And that born again and salvation bible deals with it separately not as one event not as one thing so i just go with the bible i don't know what the tradition said this this is what we have been doing for this many years but i always go back to the scriptures that is the foundation jesus said unless you're born again you see the kingdom then peter said how a person get born again like in the natural birth there has to be the spiritual birth birthing process there has to be a seed 
of God's word in bold mm -hmm. to be born. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah, but, but um, because what, what we understand is uh, being born again is the first step to salvation. Yeah. That is really the, the first, the prerequisite of yeah. everything we are going to talk about. Yeah. So born again come first. And then the process of salvation follows. Yeah. <laughs> Under this, it is a presupposition that we can have the, the discourse. Yeah. So, well, well, I just want to have your opinion because uh, you may want to uh, uh, write more books on, on this particular subject. <laughs> <laughs> well, if the Holy Spirit gives me, I will do it. Hi, Faith. <laughs> I see your hand. Okay. I, I feel like I'm very confused on <laughs> what oh, you okay. and Pastor Moses are saying, because it seems to me like you're saying backwards from each other. And we, we I, I feel like you're saying we have more people that are saved, but they haven't entered into the kingdom. They haven't seen the kingdom. They're not born again. Mm -hmm. And I feel like he's saying the opposite. No, he's saying what I wrote. I wrote in the book, born again is the first step to salvation. But then also I said, could it be possible that people, those who are saved and not born again, and those who are born again and not saved, Exactly. It's very confusing. Yeah. So, <laughs> so well, um, that's on your, your book page 58. <laughs> well, 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 that's something theoretically, there's something I need, need to clarify on, on that point. But in, in, in reality, sometimes when we talk about the kingdom of God or destinies, we do not go back to, we may not need to go back to that two concepts. For example, people may they want to know, well, I want to see God's kingdom. So I learned uh, how to cast out demons. Because Jesus said, when you use uh, the power to cast out demons, you are, you are the, the, the kingdom of God is on you. Mm, so Jesus right, has said something like that. that so there are, there are different approaches mm -hmm. to the kingdom of God, this concept. But one thing about God's word, the way God gives us the thing, he never gives us a one, two, three step to anything. Mm -hmm. And that's the way God manages his kingdom. You know, Bible is not on one, two, three step. Okay, this is the step to do this. Then we figured it out. Then when, when man figured things out, he wants to be in control. <laughs> So that, yeah, I agree. that is one of the reasons God did not give us a one, two, three step to nothing. What are the doctrines of the church? One will say there's 10 doctrines. Somebody will say there's 20 doctrines. Which one is correct? There are hundreds of doctrines in the church. No, in the, in the Bible. So what is applicable to us now? Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. matters the most. You know, right. Did you, do you know what you're called to do in his kingdom? If you know, praise God. Then you're born again, then you're saved. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's right. So which one I happens first? Right. You know, which one happens first? Salvish, uh, Darcy, go ahead. I think one of the things that I've gleaned in 41 years is the importance of the Holy Spirit. It says he will lead and guide us into all truth. Yeah. And it's so important that, I mean, I lived in, a big capacity of ministry where they're always inviting God to come and they had no sense of residency of Christ in us or us in Christ. And I think when you're dealing with these terms, I hear what you're saying, Faith, and I would just encourage you to go before the Lord in the Holy Spirit and ask him to open up the understanding of what they're saying, because I get it. I, it's challenging so much of what we've seen in classic Christianity because we've had this written um, <laughs> almost step program that has always frustrated me because it's not how I came into the kingdom. But I can tell you it's truth and it will set people free because they're not aware of the kingdom. We are about 
you know, having fire insurance and staying out of hell, but we're not aware of kingdom living. And that's what the beauty of this class is. It's going to challenge you, but the Holy Spirit will lead you. So I just would encourage you in that. Thank you. Yeah. For is that me, okay, Abraham? <laughs> perfect. See, for me, okay. there's no confusion at all. I am so settled in my heart and my spirit. Yeah. But I may not be explaining everything in perfectly. But for me, there's no confusion. It is so clear in my spirit, man, because I just know what I saw when that word came to me. Yeah. That I saw God's kingdom, the aspect of God's kingdom he wants to manifest through me or the department that I need to work in his kingdom. I just knew it. Did I know everything at that time? No. I just saw a glimpse of what he had for me. And that needs to happen to every individual. Amen. I agree. Doesn't matter how long they've been saved, how many church member, doesn't matter. That needs to happen because that is the key to everything in God's kingdom. That's the reason God sent us to this planet. And if you don't know that, there's no meaning of 50 years of being a church member or a Christian or whatever Christianity we've been part of. We miss the whole thing. So the more we dwell and meditate on this, it becomes more clearer to us. I guarantee you. It will. Moses, all your questions will be answered. <laughs> this will come to you. I guarantee you. <laughs> Because I came into God's kingdom with a lot of questions. When I heard the message of the kingdom first, I had more questions than answers. I didn't know who to go to. So I hid the message of God's kingdom in my computer, the first three books for 15 years. That was the, that was the marinating process I went through to sit on it, to grow on it, to mature on it. And then 2016, October, God said, now is the time to run with this. So it takes time for that seed to grow like a mustard seed. Kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. When it is planted, it's a small tree, but then it grows and it keeps growing and it never ends. We never graduate from God's kingdom, learning about his kingdom. Never. Not in this life, not in the next life. <laughs> okay. But thank you. I really appreciate your questions. Because it, it brings us more clarity, you know, so people to understand because we're all in different phases into our journey into God's kingdom. That's, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. So we started yeah. different time, different age, and we're all in that process in different distances and closer to our destiny. And thank God for his grace. Yes. Amen. Okay, we have two minutes to pray. So let's pray for each other for these things to our Holy Spirit to make it clear to us, unless he makes it clear. And uh, what are they saying? I have to get back to work, but this was great. Thank you. Okay, somebody just left. So let's pray for each other that you see the name. That is Darcy. Her name is not on the screen, but you pray for her. Mark, thank you, Lord. Lord and Pastor Moses, pray for each other, please. Bless them right. to make this kingdom so real and our assignment in it so real in Jesus' name. You can unmute your microphone when we right. pray to each other. Father, we thank you for this morning, this evening, whatever time zone, Father. Right. Thank you for your grace, for everything you taught us. I bless my brother Moses. I thank you for. Make uh, this kingdom uh, so real to me, Father, and your assignment. Amen, amen. I thank you for Darcy. I bless her for making this kingdom. Thank you for work and the you Ask you in your assignment, Father. I thank you for Vinnie. I bless her, Father, with the revelation of the kingdom and your assignment in it. So faith, Father, I bless her. With your grace and peace, Father, making this kingdom uh, again, born again, salvation. Jesus, you you press pray for me. and give me grace and bless my heart. With your grace, I pray for and I pray for I pray for medical. I pray, Father. Yeah, thank you for Michelle. I for my sister Michelle. I Matthew. Bless you for winning. I thank you for most of the return, oh God.
We pray that your spirit. Ja, men vi må få lov til at gøre fyldes de de ting som du har for os. Far, jeg bare priser dig. Jeg takker dig. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Thank you. Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you spoke to us. Lord, I had no idea what I was going to share. You know that, Father, when I started this lesson this morning, but you gave me. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for everything you spoke. I bless your people with clarity and guidance of your Holy Spirit, Father. That that word that we receive today, let it grow and take roots in our hearts, in our spirit, man. Because there's something special about this class, Father. There's one class on uh, Discovering Lost Kingdom Class A on Monday morning. And this class, there's something about you guys. There is a pull from the Holy Spirit that he wants to impart what he, even the last lesson we took, my goodness, I am amazed what God gives me to share with you. So you are being handpicked by God to be here, to hear what you're hearing. Father, we thank you for it and we honor you. We give you all the glory and praise as we go back to our assignment today and thank you for your glory upon us and your indwelt presence in us and we are so grateful in jesus christ's holy name we pray amen and amen this lesson will be uploaded onto youtube within 24 hours you get to watch it again i encourage you to watch it again hope you are reading the reading assignment that we emailed you in the book so please do that because that helps with the lesson and the reading assignment then you get the complete picture, then spending time with the Holy Spirit with the both of those. <laughs> and you'll do it. So good to see you, Darcy. Thank you for joining today. God bless you all. Thank you. Have a great night, Moses, there, and rest of you, Brother Mark. I will see you next week, same time, same place. Bye-bye. Thank you, Abraham. Bye-bye.